There was nothing disconsolate about the Prime Minister's demeanour at his press conference this morning. In fact, he could be said to have displayed what Conservatives used to call the resolute approach. I am confident we are going to win this general election and with a clear majority for five years. Quite confident and I'm not dealing with any other hypothesis. <coughs> a remarkable show of confidence from a man who had just been to the brink of oblivion and back. <coughs> it was a crisis that originally burst on the campaign quite unannounced. On Tuesday morning, as a regular team of journalists who follow the Prime Minister climbed aboard their bus, there was nothing to suggest that it would be in any way a day different from any other. Right, good morning everybody. Um, today we're off to Chester. We should arrive at Chester Town Centre around about 11.25. Now the Prime Minister is going to do a walkabout here and there's another soapbox opportunity. Um, this, <laughs> this will be... The routine is by now well established. The famous major battle bus is very much for public display. The Prime Minister, in fact, travels by car or aeroplane. On all these occasions, as informal as they seem, Tory supporters are tipped off in advance. Well, we were told that there was an important person coming at 11 o'clock at the Conservative office, and then we were moved on here. Did you guess rightly who it was? Did you guess rightly who well, it was? I thought it must be him, mustn't it? <laughs> Even the soapbox has its part to play in a carefully rehearsed production. Until needed, it is kept under the care and attention of one of the most valued members of the campaign staff. Shirley Stock. He's not going to sit there. Who's going to stand? Stand here. Here we are then. John. It's a two-way relationship between John Major and these gatherings of the faithful. If he excites them, they clearly do a great deal to reassure him, even providing the confidence that he will run out the eventual winner. They said no one would come. Well, in Chester, you proved them wrong. Hanging out the window, sitting on the side. In the rain, you come because you know this election is vital. Just behind the Prime Minister hovers his man Friday, the former Cabinet Minister Sir Norman Fowler, now tipped to be the next party chairman. His memories go back to another election when the Tories were also trailing in the polls. I think the thing that this reminds me of, in a sense, is the 1970 uh, general election, which was my first general election I fought. And the polls were uh, all over the place. But what we were finding on the doorstep, what we were finding in terms of public reaction at that time, is that people were coming to the Conservative Party. That is what we are finding today. I mean, the reaction we had in Chester was incredible. I mean, I've never seen uh, a situation where literally hundreds and hundreds of people uh, came onto the streets in the way uh, that they did. That sort of confidence, of course, made the blow even more devastating when it fell on Tuesday evening. John Major knew all about the adverse polls even before the presses started to roll. Can't pretend it was a wonderful night, but I've always thought that the, I knew that there'd be 60 polls between the beginning and the end, and the only poll that would really matter would be on April the 9th. All the rest are fairly irrelevant. When John Major first boarded this battle bus nearly three weeks ago, the statement on its side must have seemed to him wholly safe and quite unexceptionable. If he knows better now, then he also has proved that he knows how to cope with adversity. On the stump, he's proved a bonny fighter. But whether that will be enough to enable him to confound the prophets and win from behind is quite another question. For the moment, his looks like a campaign that started out in overconfidence, went wrong, and now has very little time in which to recover. But I thought we could make uh, progress year on year. Because no Held accountable for having put victory in peril were the media advisers at central office, usually only visible, lurking furtively at the back of the morning press conference. Sean Woodward is the Tories' 33-year-old director of communications. Very much Chris Patton's hand-picked choice for the job, he was suspect to the old guard before the campaign even started. He keeps watch over the members of the Brat Pack, like 27-year-old Tim Collins. He's the spin doctor who travels with the press, trying, none too effectively, to influence what they write. Morris Saatchi, of the famous advertising agency, is no stranger to central office. Unlike the others, he's one of the few who was involved in the campaign last time round. By Wednesday morning, all three found themselves standing very much in the dock, 
hardly helped by a good deal of gloating from the men they had replaced. In the West Country town of Thornbury, the Prime Minister, bravely trying to pursue business as usual, faced a new hazard. He was confronted by a hostile phalanx, not of the Labour Party, but of vocal Liberal Democrats. He seemed at first a little uncertain of how to cope. We need to make sure, we need to make sure that we grow in prosperity, to yield the taxes, to go on building up services as we have done in the last 12 years. The demo was in fact well behaved enough, even if no one could claim it was exactly spontaneous. You came here especially to uh, heckle the Prime Minister? So listen and heckle. You know, I, I'm, I'm not just a heckler, I like to listen, but it got rather boring, I'm afraid. Do you think there's anything wrong with heckling? Because the Prime Minister seemed to get quite irritated once or twice. Well, um, I wanted to get our message across to me, so I thought that was the best way, yeah. So I don't think there's anything wrong, no. Could I just say, I thought their message was rather limited. Yes. Dem in. I mean, it really is rather limited. Well, I mean, surely he's, he's used to heckling. I mean, he's now started the soapbox standards on, and he must be able to face up to that. I mean, he had all he had to say. I mean, he had the speaker there. So everyone was hearing. I was heckling, but I was hearing quite clearly what he was saying. And I was very upset by many things he said. But by the evening, it was back to the big top and well rehearsed acts. After Lloyd Webber comes Geoffrey Archer, reputed now to be the most influential voice at the Prime Minister's ear. ...to a packed house and the chairman rose and said, Well, my dears, we got Geoffrey here today. What is well known to you all for his debatable qualities. I've got it. I like it. And with your help, I'm going to keep it. It was John Major buoyed by the more encouraging findings from the latest polls, who's top of the hill. Having stared defeat in the face, he can afford again to hope for victory. He may never be a Heseltine, but by now it's at least a competent oratorical performance. On Friday of next week, the work of the next government will begin. It will be a Conservative government. He was a while with the audience, but they were, after all, his own folk. I thought it was terrific. You were, I have no doubts now. I loved Maggie, but I have no doubts at all. He's our man. A commander gets his troops ready to go out and fight. He's got to get that message across through us to the public. And that's what we are here, his troops. It's midnight before the press gets back. Without the media, of course, there could be no message. And the message the Tories are determined to get across is now quite clear. John Major, the gutsy candidate who deserves victory by refusing ever to contemplate the possibilities of defeat. <laughs>